Hello and welcome to another video from Night Hunter Studios. As you may be aware by now, Darklight is less than two weeks away. So far you've hopefully seen all the clips we can offer you. And not long ago you saw our resident GFX artist Riley Hooper going behind the scenes of our extensive artwork. It all looks brilliant. Like everything else on this channel, it improves with every video. You've heard my cast interview, which was really weird to do. Because I was told, JJ, do an interview, will you? And I was, yes, of course. By the way, your character, don't give much away. But this is a first. Today, I'm here with our team captain to bring you an, ex an exclusive chat with the man responsible for everything. Our esteemed director and showrunner, Sam Main. Hello, Sam. <laughs> hello, hello, JJ, hello. How are you, how are you doing? I'm alright, I'm alright, how are you? How are you? Not too bad, looking forward to Christmas. Oh, don't trust me, so am I, so am I. Busy time, busy time. Busy time, got your shopping done? Got all my shopping, no, I'll tell you the story behind that, all all Christmas sh uh, shopping gets done on Christmas Eve, uh, all wrapped Christmas Eve, and then, you know, by the tree, Christmas Day. So that that's how it works. In terms of, you know, in terms of friends, yeah, I've got that sort of, thing. but yeah, Christmas on Christmas is on track. Good, good. So let's get started at the very beginning for you then. Your, how did you come up with the idea for Night Hunter Studios? God, that, uh, how did I come up with the idea of Night Hunter Studios? What, the name or the, the entire channel and it's, you know, and what we'd be doing? The, the, yeah, pretty much the entire channel and what you would be doing. Um, I, I tell you what, I tell you what, it was around four or five years ago, uh, my friend, uh, Anne, who's actually the stunt director on uh, five out of all the seven movies we've done, and my friend Ewan Ward and I sat down um, you know, one summer holiday, and we were watching lots of machinimas made on GTA 4, and I said to him one day, why don't we make our own movie, you know, why don't we make um, our own machinima? And Ewan goes to me, well, that's a bit of a, a, bit, of a you know, bit of a challenge, don't you think? And I go, yeah, yeah, it's a bit of a challenge, but we can do it. So uh, we, got, we got a friend of mine and his, um, and we, it was just us three got together with a camera. We had no idea for the next, uh, bearing in mind at this point, we had no script, we had no cast, we had no um, established crew, we had no channel to upload it on. So this is, you know, this is completely random. And we spent two weeks with a crappy little iPad camera and the iMovie app that you could get then, and we just made this movie. Um, and obviously, following on from that, about a month later, we made the channel, Night Hunter Studios. Um, and at the beginning, there was lots of random sort of videos that went up because we really didn't know if we wanted to publish the movie. But then, of course, we made the decision to publish it um, in December. And that, that's, that's sort of how the franchise and the channel began, really. So, as you said, Blood, Bloodgrave arrived on our computer screens in late 2012, and we'll get onto the GTA series in a little while, mm -hmm. but why did you start, like, start directing these animations? What made you think this would be a great idea to do? I think because... I, thi I think because I love film. I think, I think because... I, I'll watch a movie and... I'm not one of these guys who will go and criticise it heavily. I'm one of these guys who will admire it for what it is. Um, so I love the idea of being able to tell a story um, with characters and setting and plot that you have made. And you can tell your own story to these people. And I thought from the beginning I'd, I'd love to tell a story. I'd love to take pre-made characters, obviously, um, from the GTA 4 series. I'd like to take pre-made characters and take them on our own journey. I mean, at this time, I was, what, I was 11 or 12 years old, and, you know, I still am a pretty big Bond fan, for those who know me, um, but at that time, you know, my Bond fanness, you know, the fandomness was going through the roof, so I wanted to tell my own story in a James Bondy type way, and that's just sort of what you know, really kicked it off, if I'm honest. And it's, it's not every day you'll give a movie a 10, but I remember speaking to you after Spectre came out, and you were thrilled with it, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, I was. I mean, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, which I don't think you have, have you? No, no, no. no. <sighs> That's I've got to get around to it at some point. I promise you, I will get around to it, and then it, you do, you do <laughs> need to see it. it. Um, you know, I'm not joking when I gave it a ten. I, I, I think it's it's everything that I wanted, everything that I wanted. I, mean, I think it's brilliant. So I obviously have been preparing for this interview. So I spent a few hours before we're talking now looking through 
your channel and to get a feel for you know who you are and how you started out. So it's clear to me that you wanted to be professional with all your videos, even your early stuff. You were you had that early hint of professionalism, and that's kind of been your mantra for what all your franchise now, really. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you, you could say so, I guess. I guess, yeah. So, in that vein, let's play a little word association game. <laughs> <laughs> alright, alright, okay, alright. Okay, Top Gear. Fast Lane. Right, yeah, so tell us about Fast Lane. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where it was going. Uh, I'm going to lead fast... into it slowly, but you, you beat me to it. Jump right there. Um, tell you about Fast Lane. Um, that was, that's an interesting one because. Again, uh, my friend Ewan and I, uh, we were on Forza one day, and I said to him, God, wouldn't it be amazing if we just make our own YouTube series like Top Gear? And long and behold, a week later, him and I start recording this really shitty quality. Um, you know, Ewan and I start filming it, um, and then we said, right, you know, you know, balls to the wall, really. Let's, let's see what we do it. So we just sort of, you know, put together this, uh, Top Gear inspired franchise or, or series, I should say, really. So, and obviously, you you were quite young when you started that. I listened to it earlier today, and your yes. voice, your voice. Yes, this. <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> yeah, quite young. Yeah. Still, your voice hasn't broken. You know all that. Yeah, yeah. So, the evolution of Sam Main is documented through Night's Hunter Studios. If you care to go back and look through every video. <laughs> And I I urge you to if you've got time to go do that. It's you will enjoy yourself. Um, jokes, jokes have been made. Jokes have yeah, been made. Yes. Um. So let's get on to the main reason we're here. Your early idea for the GTA franchise. How did you come up with Nico Bellic as a concept and pretty much that whole world, if you like? Oh God. Uh, oh, that's. Uh, how did I come up with it? Um. I think it was the, like I said earlier, the inspiration behind the Bond movies. Um, I also, we needed, we needed a character that was physically and emotionally strong. Um, and at the time, excuse me, and at the time, um, we were finding difficulty coming up with a persona or a, for a character. Uh, we, were, we were having difficulty coming up with a character in general to, to play the main guy. Um, and I just said at the end of the day, well, why don't we just use Nico Bellic? Why don't we use the guy off GTA 4? And at the time, you know, all of them went, are you insane? Are you stupid? This guy who's an immigrant um, came into Liberty City and is, you know, a murderer, um, you know, done all, all this crazy shit. You know, you can't go and make him the hero of your movie. Um, and at the time, I sort of agreed with them. I said, yeah, OK. We backed away from that, but when we were really coming, you know, to the point where we didn't have any ideas, we we experimented with the idea in the first movie of using Nico Bellic as the main character, um, and ob obviously it worked, and it sort of progressed through through the movies, and that, that that's where it sort of got up to now, really. And I know, obviously, from speaking to you, that you've kind of got this whole story for Nico planned out. You've kind of you started off with this concept that was obviously given to you in a game where you couldn't cr create a new character, so you've had to stick with what you had. But you've gone and you've really made him your own. You've come up with this whole backstory for him that obviously we can't go into. No. But you, you, you definitely have made him your own. Do you feel like he is your own? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, I think he's obviously he's a different Nico Bellic to what everybody else thinks. I think... Um, I, th I think he's ours. I think, you know, it, it's a symbol for what we've made. And I think, you know, for those who have been with the franchise for a while now, I think if you were to show them a picture of the actual character that we use, they'll go, that's Nico Berg. I'm pretty... Because, you know, it it's at this point where people are beginning to realise the franchise and people are beginning to realise the character and how he's evolved. I think that because of that, it... It represents not just us as a channel, but the entire franchise, really, and, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. You've definitely been able to overcome various obstacles with this. Obviously, mm. I've, I've seen a few of them. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the early iPad, um, obviously, subtitles for 
speech. Yeah. That. What What did you think of that? What did I think of it from the start, or what do I think of it now? What What, what did you think from the start, and what did you What do you think of it now, looking back? From the start, I thought it was a marvelous idea. I thought, yes, brilliant. We're going to get loads of views. It's going to be brilliant. Think of it now. What the hell was I thinking of? That's honestly what I, I, I because the, what we've what I think for me personally as a filmmaker, we've we've learned through this that the whole thing of this franchise has been about change. There's been a change in every single movie, whether it's the length of the movie, the, if, there's, if there's a voice cast, if there's um, you know the quality or the recording devices, or indeed how the movie is presented. Just like as you said, Bloodgrave with the subtitles uh, and the uh, crappy iPad camera um i look back at it and i'm i'm not i'm embarrassed to show people it because there's, there's a saying your first movie is always your best in this case it's not i the first movie is the worst and i i don't like showcasing bloodgrave which is why there's been lots of discussion as I, obviously you know as well um about rewriting it and doing it you know with the quality we're at now there's been a lot of discussion about that um, because I want I want to tell the story again in a in a better way where more people will watch it, but they'll also get a feeling of the character from the very beginning, what he was like at the very beginning, and because of you know how I feel about it at the minute and how I you know when I look back at it how I feel about when watching it, I feel quite embarrassed nearly to show that. I mean, yeah, it's you know the first movie and we were only eleven or twelve years old, but still you know. It, it, Seeing where we are now and comparing it to when we were back then, it, you know, it, a it's a milestone and b it's it's quite, it's a shocker basically to to look back at. Well, I think looking back at obviously your whole channel, every movie has been an evolution of the last. You've added more to it. You've improved with everyone. Um, if we think about obviously second wave, your second film, and that was the introduction of voices albeit yes. computer voices, but it was still an improvement from your first film. Mm. And then, obviously, it, I think it was um, Forevermore, where everything really sort of started coming together. Would, would you agree? Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. Um, the second wave was... We, we sat down, after Bloodgrave was released, we sat down and we said, right, it hasn't gone very well, but we love movies, we still want to make another one, so we'll try it out with the, with the second one. And if the second one doesn't go well, we'll scrap it. If the second one does go well, we'll continue. And quite clearly, it did go well. And for me, for me, the second wave was an experiment. It was a guinea pig to see if we can, adding in some more improvements, see if we can build something from it. Um, I obviously felt that it did, and so did the producers. So we moved forward and made Forevermore, as you said. And in Forevermore, every like you just rightly stated, everything changed. New setting, new characters. That, that was the introduction of Grand Theft Auto V. That was exactly. You know, uh, GTA V had just released after um, the second wave, which is quite interesting because um, after the second wave, we had nine months to prepare Forevermore until GTA V released. So we had that amount of time. And even then, we got to when GTA 5 was going to release, but then we learned that two weeks after GTA 5 was going to release, we learned that GTA Online would be up. So we had two extra weeks to prepare for it. So in my in my mind, when I look back at Forevermore, and as you said, sort of, that Forevermore is like the, the bottom figure of a Jenga pile. Um, Forevermore works as a basis for the, for the franchise now because... Not not because of what happens in the movie. Obviously, Nico faking his death. Um, we are seeing sort of Nico go through this journey of you know defeating a terrorist cell that is not only incredibly powerful and dangerous, but one that's also always evading him and one that's always one step ahead of him. We really do see Nico, you know, get challenged and you get stretched to the next level. And there's not been a lot of movies in the franchise that's been like that. And for me, although it was not the best quality, uh, obviously it was it was it was cut in parts because of copyright issues. For me, it it had the the most amount of time for a movie to prepare for, and because of that, it, it allowed us to expand and to 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 make the, the you know the movies in the future even better because of it. Was it difficult to prepare for though? Because obviously at the time, I mean, I remember getting GTA Five on the release day. I pre-ordered it. 
but no one was really 100% sure what would be in it, what online features there would be. Did that make it difficult to try and plan ahead and guess? It made it inc- yeah, it made it incredibly difficult. Um, we sort of, we we had an idea for a, a, a script about six months before the game was released. Um, and at that point, obviously, like you rightly stated, you know, we didn't know what was going to be in the game. You know, we didn't know how the game was going to uh, operate. We didn't know uh, the mechanics. Um, one thing that's very important when writing a script, usually, if you've played a game for long enough, and obviously, as you and I know, we've played the game for quite a long time now, you, we know how the game operates. We know what we can do. We know the limitations. If you don't know them at the beginning, your writing uh, for the script becomes very um, restricted. And we're still, we're still case, trying to push them limitations. We'll get onto that a little bit later on. A little bit later on, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that will be explained. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it was very... There was a lot of restrictions because, of course, like you said, we didn't know what was what was in the game. In terms of plot and character, no, not really. We wanted to really push the barrier and make sure that the characters were even better. And obviously, judging by the reviews of the movie, they were pretty good. So, you know, I'll let that speak for itself, you know. So, obviously, as we've already said, your films have evolved with every one. But I mm. think the next significant milestone came with Insurgency, with the introduction of human voices for the first time. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, insurgency is... For me, Insurgency is a milestone, but it's also a failure, in my eyes. Um, obviously, you have the advancements of... Um, obviously the voice cast the editing was I think was a lot crisper I think this, uh, the soundtrack was on point I think the um, the experimentation obviously with locations there was that... definitely a lot of experimentation like for, throughout the whole thing you did for want of a better word a complete overhaul of it yeah. obviously it was the first one where I had come in because obviously we had started talking and we had sort of got to know each other. That we both liked editing. We both have a passion for the whole filmmaking side of things. Yep. So you tasked me to to create the GJ titles, and that was sort of the beginning of what we could now presume to be the traditional sort of the traditional titles for your film, where it would be clips and stuff yeah. coming in like that. Yeah, you know, the, the, I like that. And I like how, as you just rightly stated, we can expect it to be a tradition. You will expect it. You know, you will expect you know nine minutes into the movie for the glorious opening titles to appear with a with a custom song. Sometimes a custom song, sometimes one that's just been chosen, but one that's been chosen specifically for the film. And yeah, Insurgency did showcase that. And I think, I think Insurgency really did put on a really good face for the <laughs> franchise. And it, it obviously it's broken the record of the amount of views. It, I don't know what it's on now, but uh, it's the I most think viewed it's on movie. just over one and a half thousand now. I looked so, back earlier to say it. Yeah, it's about one thousand six hundred odd. So you know, it, it, it is one of, in fact, it is the most popular video on our channel in terms of the franchise. We're, we're quite a small channel. We're only one hundred eighty odd subscribers, and you know, one and a half thousand views on a video for me is it's quite touching. You know, it's quite thankful to the people who've watched it. Um, it's quite a milestone as well because. We're at this point now where we are getting in more viewers, we're getting in more people who are interested in the franchise, and obviously Insurgency brought more people in because of, obviously, we expanded expanded the horizon, bring people into voice, uh, to voice the characters, you know, location here, location there, and the whole idea of that made Insurgency one of the best films we've made, I think. So now, now we're into the juicy bit of the conversation, the bit that we're all here, to really learn about the writing process of the whole series. Has the, what has been your writing process thus far? Oh, it's what's the writing process? Um, usually it, it starts off with me watching a movie. Uh, I'll watch a movie and I'll sit there and I'll go, I really like this. So a lot of the movies, for those who have watched the they have a little bit of inspiration from other movies, most of them being Bond movies, but there have been some from Mission Impossible. I know there's a bit of Ronin, a very classic film in there. Um, there's a lot of inspiration from real movies. And, we, we, you know, we sit down, we watch a movie, or we, we sit down and we think. You know, we literally sit there lying on a bed with music in the background and just think about ideas. We do that. And we just come up with this list of huge, of, of you know, pages and pages of ideas. 
when we have that, we choose a plot, we choose characters, we make the characters up. One thing that um, I like to specifically do is when I'm making a new character, especially a villain, um, come up with a backstory. Come up, come up with what, what do they, what do they like to drink in the morning? You know, what do they wear? You know, what do they usually say? What's their idiot? I know I've had obviously the pleasure of joining and seeing your whole writing thing, and mm. you, you are a bit of a stickler for coming up with this whole backstory. I know obviously there are some characters that have come and gone or will come. Um, yeah. You're always sort of coming up with new characters, or if someone else is coming up with a new character, you I know firsthand you expect them to have this whole backstory, a reason it's got to intricately fit into the plot, and I think that's a really poignant thing for you and your writing process. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think creating unique characters is one thing. I think if you make a character that's memorable, people will go back to that video in the future and go, Yeah, I know, I know this character. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Drax, yeah, he's, he's a good guy. Well, not a good guy, but, you know, he's a cool guy, you know? And I think if you really create a character and you really, if you know their backstory, it, it makes the film and the script definitely much, much better. You know, it makes it, um, it allows you to express what the film is about in many different ways, I think. And I, I feel that, especially in Darklight, I think the writing is pretty much on point, I really do, I think. You know, the character development is pretty surreal. You get to really see the character development. Um, it took a long time, actually, and a lot of rewrites to get this film um, up to where it is. I think that's uh, worth pointing out as well, because many, many people would expect a YouTube film to be, I don't know, knocked up in five minutes. But for you and this whole process, that's not the case, is it? There's no. been, I think, oh, you've obviously you finished Darklight, and you're, you're already planning two or three films. Like even with Insurgency, you were already writing Darklight. You are already planning Darklight. So you're always two or three films ahead. Yeah, that's the case. I mean, I, it's like, um, it's like with the Harry Potter franchise. You know, she wrote the ending and then wrote everything before that. Because if you, have, if you, know, your, if you know your ending, you know where you're going to go. Um, in a way, you can say we've done that. You know, we... we we were coming up with ideas for the final movie. We're coming up with ideas for the next one and the next one. You know, if you, if you think we're writing the next one, we are. That's it. That's, I mean, that's all I can say, really, because if you have the time, especially in the post-production of a movie, you have the time in the evenings to just go and write a scene or write a page. You have the time to do that. And you have the... It's not like a real movie, where in a real movie the post-production is one of the busiest um, next to production, it is the busiest because you're, you're actually putting the movie together. Whereas with a machinima, your post production is quite laid back because you are you can edit that you can edit the movie and a scene per day if you wanted. There's no rush to get you know x amount of scenes done per day. There's no rush for that. You can do it in your own time. So when that's added on, you can you can just sit down one evening, cup of coffee, you know, and just go and write this write this script that you want. And that's sort of what we do. You know, we we we. Take it one step at a time. We, as a, yeah, as you said, we take it one step at a time. But we, we've always got sort of these little ideas, and we, we we've got that scope to I don't know about you, but go back and change a few bits and think, oh, that idea hasn't worked. We did write that six months ago, but things have changed. Yeah. So there there is a lot more scope for that. So the yeah, there is. Yeah. The the editing process is one that has been really intriguing. Obviously, yeah. first hand, I came in with Insurgency and done the titles. I did the titles for Darklight. And I know that you were quite a stickler for getting the editing right. I, I realised today, looking back, because I've had an alert message on my phone for the past three months. Your phone is full, your phone is full. And I looked today, and I've actually still got three drafts of the Insurgency opening credits that I was putting on my phone every morning to say, how about this? And... Every time I would go back with changes left, right, and centre, you know, my list. That's that's a funny thing because for the, for the people watching or listening, JJ would uh, come into um, the break room at lunch. He'd come and show me Sam. Here we go, first draft. I'd look at the opening credits and I'd go, "Oh my god, this is brilliant." But. However, that was always that was always the case for the lunchtime. And I remember a lunchtime specifically. 
It was one of the final drafts of the opening credits, and JJ came to me and said, right, come on now, this is good. So we watched all the way through, and it was perfect. However, there was two seconds of frame at the very end when the director's credit came up. I wasn't satisfied with the where it was with the music, so I told you to go back and redo it again. Then that, two that... seconds aggravated me for three weeks. I spent three <laughs> weeks on two seconds of the whole bloody thing. <laughs> You know, the editing is, is, is an important part and if the editing's not there I, I think the movie isn't going to be as showcased as well as you wanted it to I mean obviously the editing changes all the time and you know I still I still go back because of course we send the, the, we send the movie off to other people to go and look and to go and make their own changes I mean I have we have a draft of the dark light coming back within the next few days um, for visual effects that we've, we've requested um, but I'll always go back and I'll, I'll be changing little parts of scenes. Like, for example, we had to do um, a re-record of someone's voice lines last week because the audio quality was pretty crap. So I, I, I knew, I pictured what it was going to be like if I was going to, if I was to sit down on Christmas Eve and watch Darklight, with that audio quality, I would not be satisfied. So I put the time and the effort in to make sure that the voices were right. That's sort of the, the approach we take, I think. And I, I know that obviously you enjoy getting that sort of constructive feedback. Um, obviously, with Dark Light, as, as another first for the series, you have allowed people to view it yeah. before general release. And I was lucky enough to be one of them. And you emailed me and you said, look, I, I need a list of things to go over and redo. And so we sat down and we worked it all out. And I'm pretty sure that obviously some of it beforehand even before your visual effects went in, it looked absolutely stunning. You lot are going to be in for a treat in two weeks' time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm really glad you liked it. And, you know, I think we, we sat down, I actually sat down with the producer, and I, I said to him, look, we need to know what this film's going to be like. The reason I said earlier that I'm not keen on insurgency was because, for me, and obviously you know this, I feel personally, as the filmmaker, that it lacks something. The, the Retribution, which is something we didn't bring up, uh, which is the fifth movie, and by far, at the minute, the largest movie we've ever done. Um, and, uh, Retribution, sorry, had you know had the themes and it had the characters and it had the development and it had the really stunning action sequences and the music. Everything was on point, apart from one thing: the voices. The voices were still automated. So with Insurgency, we aimed to improve that. And obviously, personally, personally, I think the script was pretty shit, if I'm honest. I, I really do think that. I, I think the script was lacking a lot. Uh, there were so many rewrite, uh, rewrites, sorry. Um, you know, I don't know, there wasn't... Obviously, this was the first movie where we collaborated with another person. Um, I, I won't name said person, but you, you, will, um, you can sure find that out. Um, but there wasn't enough communication. If you don't have enough communication with your writer, you're not going to produce the best thing. And in this case, I feel I feel part of it was Batman, part of it was Mission Impossible, part of it was Bond, and part of it was G.I. Joe. I feel that. I feel it was all crammed into one movie. And it crammed into, you know, the director's cut, which is, you know, my cut was two hours long. My cut was originally two hours long. It was going to be a two-hour long movie. But the, it had to be cut by 30 minutes, which really annoyed me. Because with that extra 30 minutes added on, it would have felt better, but it didn't. Because we had to cut it down, and obviously w we were w worried that the movie wasn't going to do so well, if it was so long. So we cut it down, and it, it became what it is. And honestly, for me, it's, n it's, n it's, it's near blood grave in terms of how much I like it. That's m my honest opinion. That's. Do you think that maybe you cut it down or limited things because it was your first go with human voices so obviously you were limiting the amount of cast had to say you would have increased production time getting the voices anyway so maybe you were i don't know trying to meet targets in terms of getting it out there um no no i i wouldn't say because of the voices i'd say because we, we cut it down for one reason to not bore the audience um, originally, in a lot of drafts before, because of course you were a voice actor with Insurgency, and you you didn't know this, um, but there was a draft of Insurgency where it was. I was killed ten seconds after my first line. <laughs> <laughs> you you do get killed off quite quickly, mate. Um, 
yeah, there, there was there was a draft of insurgency that was a hundred and thirty pages long, a hundred and thirty. That's nearly two hours and thirty minutes. Okay, and that draft had a lot of dialogue, and we want at that time. I, I, th- I think we went through a phase where we just wanted action. More action, 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 action. That's what we wanted. And we got that. Obviously, we made it, but the story wasn't on point. And I think that's one of the things. I think we just tried to cut it down to make sure that the action and the audience was interested. That is quite a good... You've, you've got to have that balance between storyline and action to really yeah, get agree, the point agree. across. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it worked out well for what it was. And um, obviously, your next improvement for Darklight um, mm. is mouths that move. We finally got the mouths that move. Yeah, finally. Got, that's an interesting story. Um, originally, that wasn't going to happen. Originally, it was just going to be like insurgency with no mouth moving. Um, I remember lobbying then, for that every day. Sam, you've got to have mouths that move. <laughs> <laughs> you were, actually, that's a good point. You were telling me a lot. Sam, we have to have this. We have to have yeah. this. But we never did. And I think it was the first day, um, first recording day, I just went, nah, fuck it. Let's just do it. You know. So we went in and we did it. And I'm really glad. They work. It I did. Think they work. It did. The, the, yeah, the yeah, hours yeah, we just sat there on the Xbox talking nonsense into a microphone for 10 seconds a time. The amount, of stuff, the amount of stuff that we say on the mic just to get it moving. I mean, sometimes it doesn't even fit, but it adds, it, as you rightly stated to me, obviously, in your in your long review, which you guys will see, obviously, after that was released, you said to me that the voices and the moving moving with the mouth really added on to the scene. You were felt you felt more engaged, and I'm really, I'm really glad that you felt that. So... Obviously, Dark Plank coming out in two weeks. Mm-hmm. It's looking to be a bit. It's looking to be really good. I have seen it. I can guarantee it will be really good. And I've seen it before the improvements were made, so it can only get better. Um, what? Obviously, you can't talk too much about the future. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I know more than I can tell. But yes, you, you, you careful. Yeah. <laughs> um, careful, yeah. <laughs> oh dear, my job's on the line. Um, <laughs> What's next for Nico Bellic that you can say? Uh, ooh, um, what's next for him? A holiday. A That's holiday. one thing. I think a holiday is definitely in need for him. Oh, you're going with Stephen Moffat on the viewers. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a nice holiday somewhere. Um, I. The thing about Nico, the thing about Nico is um, he's a very unpredictable guy. So he'll, you know, he'll go off into the lands of, you know, Tunisia or Turkey or whatever. He'll go and, you know, get laid, whatever, twice a night. And, you know, he'll go and, you know, go and get drunk somewhere, you know, whatever. Okay, the guy can do what he wants. I think um, if we're talking story here, if we're talking story, well, if we're talking story, then, um, you know, it's a difficult one because I feel personally that, Originally, um, Nico's adventure after Retribution was meant to be a two-part thing. It was meant to be a two-part uh, movie contract. So Insurgency and Darkway, obviously, because Darkway is the sequel to Insurgency. Um, so I feel personally that there's a sense of complete... I don't know about you. I don't know about you when you uh, viewed this, but I, I got a sense of completion at the end of this movie. I felt like everything returned to normal and everything was you know, ready to move on. I felt that when I was writing and editing it. That's what I felt. And... I think in, for the future, I can. Uh, a lot of bad stuff is going to happen. I, can, I think I can tell you that. Uh, I can't tell you what. I can't tell you who. Uh, I can't tell you if he's going to die. I can't. I can't tell you any of this. I can't. I can't do it because a it would you know take away from the take away from the um, the experience in the future and b because I don't want to. That, that's that's honestly yeah. what it is. So you know we'll we'll see we'll see. Lots of action. That's what I can say. Tell them. Yeah. Lots of action. Can can you and will you disclose the number of films? Have you already? I'm not sure. Uh, that. Ooh, do I do it? Do I do or, it? Or, or would that still? I think that would still be giving too much away, wouldn't it? No. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. I'll say. I'll say. Um, the big number that's floating around at the minute is ten. There that, you go. That's a world exclusive, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. A, wor- a world exclusive. That world exclusive. Time. World exclusive. You know, um, 
10 seems like a solid and good number to end. And um, because I I know what's going to happen in the future, um, they're, you're in for a ride for the next couple of films. I, I can say that. Will it be easy to leave? No. Uh, I've been asked this question uh, many, many times. And... Um, I've actually I've been in discussion um, with other writers as well. Obviously, JJ, you're a writer, and um, I can't officially say it, but JJ may, wink, wink, be on uh, a future movie. May. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've spoken to other uh, writers uh, who are very good friends of mine, and we've been thinking about how how we'll end it. And a lot of them are te- a lot of them are telling me we'll kill him, just kill him for God's sake. And I'm sitting there going. This guy has been through 10 movies. This guy has destroyed terrorist cells. He stopped a nuke. He's, you know, he's, he's stopped an assassin. He's, he's stopped a hell-bent FIB agent. You can't just go and kill him. You know, I think um, the ending, it, it, it's, it's going to be difficult for me personally because, of course, we've been, I've been with him, this, this character, since the start for, you know, for five or six years now. So it's going to be difficult for me. For other, for, I know for other people who are, who help who help are going to be quite relieved it's over because it, <laughs> it's very stressful and it, it always is. And there's a lot of people who don't like the franchise. We won't name individuals, but <laughs> JJ and I get the drift. Um, and there's a lot of people who do like the franchise. And you know, for the people who do like it, I think it's going to be very difficult for them to not see Nico Bellic will return at the end. I, I think that's going to be quite difficult. And um, all I can say is, don't take. The ending right to heart that's all i can say try not to do, do you think that maybe like because i know you and i know that eventually you will get an urge to go back to it do you think that maybe alive or dead you will find a way maybe a spin-off or something uh yeah i really do i think if i, if I really sit down and think about it and i really um tune in uh to the idea that i can bring him back um, or bring the franchise back, uh, then yeah, I, I I think we could we could find a way. It depends on the ending. If I if I feel the ending is as good as the ending should be, I will not go back because I'd like I'd like to leave it at a good note. Will Will Bloodgrave get a reboot? That's a simple question. Yes, it will. Yeah. So you're you're definitely going to re- well, reboot Bloodgrave. Uh, well, uh, it's a difficult one. Um. Why, I, the whole film is not going to be rebooted. Uh, JJ doesn't actually know this uh, because um, I've been speaking primarily with uh, another writer. Um, JJ, um, as I said, you probably won't know this, but um, there will be elements of Bloodgrave featured in future films. That's all I can say. Ah. Mm. But yeah, that, that, I, can't, I can't tell you what. You know. <laughs> I can't tell you what. So you're obviously looking at, towards the end of your Bellic franchise, but yes. what what would be the future for Night Hunter Studios? Because I'm sure that that's going to continue. Um, what would the future? Maybe a whole new franchise. Start again. Why not? Um, maybe short films. Maybe short machinimas. Maybe gameplay videos. Maybe live action. There's a lot. There's a lot of um, discussion going around at the minute that we're going to be doing a live action movie. Um, I'd love to. Um, that, that would be great. Very, very, very good to work on. I think. Um, I don't know. If if it depends also when uh, when the franchise ends. If the franchise ends um, in a, in my gap year, which I am taking, um, then I may do a few more videos in terms of film. If it ends before I go to uni. The chances of it, you know, progressing as it is, is very limited. Uh, we're, good, we're just going to have to wait and see, I think. I think you've had a hell of a long ride with, obviously, your GTA and Nico Bellic franchise. Because, as you said, you were 11 when it started, and now you're ju- what, nearly halfway through your first year at A-levels. Mm. Um, you're ob- this is obviously, uh, the scope of the thing, going to take you to just before uni. That's a hell of a chunk of your life. Your entire teenage years have been dedicated to Nico Bellic. Well, 
I wouldn't say dedicated. I wouldn't say, you know, spending <laughs> nights, you know, just scribbling up ideas. I, I wouldn't say that. But, yeah, I'd, Mate, I'd say... I have had I, messages from you at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> JJ, this is a great we, we've idea. We've had our fair discussion. This would be fair great. Discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's... I, I, it's going to be... It's, like I say, it's going to be difficult because, of course, I've been with him since I was very young and um, I, I like where it's gone. I, I like... I like this idea. I, I'll be able to look back in five years' time and go, bloody hell, we made ten of these? Jesus. You know? And I like that idea. I think it's quite good. I think I'll be able to, maybe one day in the future, I can just go back and watch, you know, oh, I'll go watch number eight, or number seven, or number one. You know what I mean? I can go do that. But yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. Something to show the children. Yeah, something. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> something for the grandkids. <laughs> um, what what would you like to see improving from a production and a technical standpoint? Do you have uh, ideas? Yeah, I do. Um, I know a lot of people have been complaining, and I've taken this, I've taken this, you know, quite heavily on, um, that we use the th- the third person camera too much in the movie, and. One thing in the future, and for definitely future movies, is um, we've we're purchasing new uh, recording equipment. I can't give details away, but it's new recording equipment, one that's a lot better than the current one that we use. We're going to be using the Rockstar Editor a lot more. It's going to be a lot better for the action sequences as well. Um, obviously, upgrading uh, the editing software that we use. Um, I'd love to bring more people on. I always say this: I, if you if you have an Xbox One. GTA 5, Xbox Live, and a headset, you know, why not? Come along, help us one day. Because there's always a scene you can help out with. There's always something that you can, you know, go and get involved in. Getting more people into the franchise brings a new perspective on it. And I love that. I love getting new people involved and, you know, listening to their ideas and putting their ideas in this franchise. And obviously that can bring a whole new perspective on things, new ideas. You never quite know what you're going to get. And... Obviously, I know that your Night Hunter Studios is a part of fu- Future, I believe. Or no, sorry, Freedom. Um, yes. How, how have they helped and, well, improved your franchise? Well, they, 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 have, they have helped so much. I mean, without Freedom, I don't think this franchise, franchise would be anywhere. Uh, we were at quite a struggle um, after the fourth movie. Because I, I think, it, yeah, it was the fourth movie we actually started putting real money into this thing. Okay. Um, it was with Retribution as well that we had we had to put, you know, I'm talking 40 quid worth of Grand Theft Auto dollars on that you can get. Uh, put those microtransactions on to actually buy the equipment we needed. And we were finding it, finding it difficult to get the money and get the support. Freedom came in at, the char- at that time, at that time period between the fourth and fifth one, where we needed the support. And they were there and... We, we signed up to them. We're quite known by them now. We've been reviewed a few times, and the reviews have been, you know, I can say they've been pretty good. Um, a lot of the, for example, my dedicated friend and collaborator, Riley Hooper, who's obviously the, 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 the director of uh, cinematography and um, GFX unit. If you haven't seen his behind the scenes videos yet, I urge you to check that out. You will learn so yeah. much about the whole production process. It is a very, very good video indeed, and he, he, he made it all by himself. And you know, and we met him on Freedom. We actually met him on Freedom, and and you know, he has been such an asset to this. He really has. He brings new ideas. He brings, um, you know, he br- he brings a sense of oh, why do we do this, or can I add this in. What if I do this, guys? It always questions it, and, I'm, and the questions come in, and I love it. I love it so much because, you know, we, we get to see we get to see it from his perspective, and we get to see him put, you know, develop his skills. I mean, the first poster that he made for us, it was okay. It wasn't brilliant, but it was okay. Now, though, the posters, the artwork, it's all there. It's brilliant, and I, I'm I, I, I'm literally in love with the artwork that he produces for it, and I really hope he does come back, obviously, for the future. But yeah, freedom has been um, an immense asset to us. Um, it, 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 it is in discuss- we, We've been offered by another company, uh, one I can't name, uh, to go with them for the future. Obviously, contract states that we can't leave the um, the the, the, the association. Um, 
if we're currently working on a project. So when, the minute Dark Light is released, we're going to be having discussions of do we stay with them or do we go with this other company? We're going to have to wait and see. So there, there is definitely big things on the horizon. Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, 2016 is going to be a very, very big year, I think. You don't, you, you're definitely going to expect some, you know, you're going to expect some more and you're going to expect it, you know, very soon. Sam, thank you very much for joining me. Not a problem, JJ. Thank you very much for the interview. And for those of you who are looking forward to Dark Light, I know I am. Two weeks, the 24th of December, Christmas Eve. So you can turn your Christmas music off for a couple of hours and sit down and enjoy Dark Light. For more videos on Night's Hunter channel, please like, share and subscribe for all the latest Dark Light news and any future films that Sam may or may not be releasing. <laughs> <laughs> From all of us here at Night Hunter Studios, we'll see you soon.